Colleen Petit, thank you very much for joining me today. And welcome pleasure, to the thank channel. You. Thank you. You've got a very interesting career span. You've been a pilot for over 40 years. You have a PhD in aviation specializing in safety and also published numerous books. It would be great to hear about your background, your story. Um, thank you, Matt. Yeah, you know what, actually, I wasn't one of those little kids who was taken to the airport uh, by dad and looked at the airplanes and stuff. I was playing a game called Careers. And back in the day, I think the game's still out there, but back in the day, you could be a hostess, which is today's flight attendant. So that's how old it is. So you could be a hostess, a model, a librarian, a school teacher. And, and my friends and I, we all wanted to get on the hostess spot, but I couldn't get on it. They all got it. I was able to spin the wheel, move around the board. And they got on this hostess spot and I couldn't. And I said, I don't care. I don't want to be a post, the hostess. I'm going to be the pilot. And one of my friends sitting there, we we're all nine years old. She said, you can't be a pilot. And I said, yes, I can. She goes, no, you can't. My dad's a pilot. He said, girls can't do that. And I said, yes, I can. No, you can't. I got a little kid argument. All right, game's over. Ran upstairs, said, mom, I'm going to be a pilot. Can I be a pilot? And she said, I don't care what you do. Get out of the kitchen. I'm making dinner. Okay. So from nine years old, I decided I was going to be a pilot simply for the reason I was told I couldn't do it. And then here I am. And uh, ironically, after eight different airlines, I ended up at Delta and her dad was a Delta pilot. <laughs> so, so it kind of pulled me full circle, you know, and they still don't think women should be pilots, but that's a whole nother story. So <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. But was it very difficult for you to become a pilot as a woman at those times? Uh, back in the day it was. And, and the challenge was you had to be perfect. You had to be better than everyone else. And so y you think that uh, I've learned in my life, perfectionism is not what we need to strive to be. We just strive to be the best we can because perfect is that goal that you will never achieve. Okay, because there is no such thing as perfect. You can always be better at yourself or whatever you're doing. But back then, we had to because anything that you did, uh, any any mistake, any human factors, any human error that that maybe a hundred male pilots would make, if you did it, even at a lesser scale, it'd be oh my god, look at that woman pilot. They're bad, and so it really got flagged. And so being one of the early women flying, I kind of figured that. I had to set a better, set the example. So I had to set a really high bar. And the good thing about that is it um, made me, I studied harder. I learned more. I, you know, would I have, I wonder if I was in today's society where they're just taking pilots, you see all these pilots coming in and they're, they're not studying. They don't understand the aircraft. They're just showing up and going, teach me and pushing the buttons. You know, I wonder if my personality I would have been like that. I would have studied anyway. I, I, I don't know. But but I do know that I always remember you couldn't make a mistake. You had to be good, 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 good. And so okay. you worked really hard. Yeah. Do you think women have it easier now to become a pilot? Or is the industry still saturated with men dominating the pilot industry? <laughs> This is an interesting thing. I think that anyone has the ability to be pilot. I actually, in my, uh, in my, one of my master's courses, I wrote a paper, why women make better pilots than men. Okay. Now I kind of did it with tongue in cheek, but I went and researched it. I, I mean, it was all supported by research, you know, the, from our type of vision for our multitasking ability, you know, from experience raising kids, you could be on the telephone, cooking dinner and knowing what the children are, do, are doing. You could be in an airplane running a checklist, talking to flight attendants with your engine burning. Okay. Same thing. So, so I kind of wrote this paper kind of funny, but we really do have the skills. Women and men have the same skills. The really skill that depends what's really important to become a pilot is do you have the passion for it? Because it's hard. It's you're away from home. The lifestyle is challenging. Your uh, health is always on the line. Every year you got to get your medical. Um, 
so if you don't have that passion, whether you're a man or a woman, you're probably not going to be as successful or enjoy it. So I, while I support 100%, we should have career opportunity for everyone. I don't necessarily think we should go out and be harvesting people to put them into a job that they might not like, you know, that might not be, be there for them. We should open up the opportunity for them if they have the passion and desire and the aptitude, you know, so yeah, but but as far as a job, it's uh, um, yeah, same for men, men and women. Except for if you want to have a family, that that's that is a, a a struggle. Things have to give because typically we're still in that generation where the women take care of the kids, and especially back when I was having kids and flying, I would come home from work and all the laundry would still be there for me waiting to be done, and and I would do it. I was I was at the generation of do it all before me women couldn't work now women could work and I was in that generation where we had to do it all okay and if I could tell anyone today any woman today or even a man if you think you have to do it all don't you don't get help ask for help you know if I could go back and do anything in those days of childhood and working I would have find, hired a full-time housekeeper and a gardener <laughs> You know, it would it would it would have saved me. But I thought that I had to come home from work and I still had to do do everything else. And I really didn't. That was my self imposed perception. So, you know, that'd be one thing. Hire help, get help you need because it's worth it. It really is. Okay, you've studied aviation safety. You've got a PhD. I did. Tell me about this. What does it entail? Is it more about the safety of the airplane to prevent crashes or more towards uh, the passengers educating them how to feel comfortable flying uh, yeah. in those turbulent situations? No. So an aviation safety uh, degree at the doctor level is is really, it's about passenger safety. It's about safe operations. What I learned when I went into this, which changed the whole course of my life and uh, was safety management systems. It's how we should as airlines be operating and in the safest manner. It's about a risk mitigation tool. And it's a federal, SMS is a federal regulation and it had been enacted um, before I got in there and, and I'm down at Emory Riddle, the leading aeronautical university as an adult going back to school for my third degree. And I'm hearing SMS, MS, SMS, and they're talking about this. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm an idiot. I don't even know what that is. It's never been mentioned in my airline. you know. So I go back to my room at night and I Google it. And I'm going, oh, this is interesting. And um, you know, you would say it was like a concept of safety, but really it's a federal regulation. And, and what I learned when I went through that course is that my airline wasn't following that regulation and in many ways. And so um, I don't know if you know this, but I had written a safety report based on that, on my research, on my studies and presented it to my airline. And then they subsequently paid a doctor $74,000 to say it was crazy. And so, yeah. And so what had happened is, and you know, my whole course of my life, you wonder why things happen. And I start out flying because I'm told uh, girls can't do it. And that's a culture, that's a perception. Okay. Yes, they can. But back, back then they were told. And so I went to eight, I worked at eight different airlines and each airline I went to, I loved it. But then the door shut down. I got furloughed. Uh, I the airline went bankrupt, or so I was almost like the universe was guiding me to the next choice. And I had been flying at Tower Air, a 747, and ready to upgrade to captain on that airplane. And Northwest Airlines called me and said, "Hey, we we'd like you to come and work for us." And at the time, I was uh, thinking now. I'm tired. I'm tired of changing airlines. Love my job. Going to be a captain. This could be great. And during that decision-making, when I finally decided, nope, this, this opportunity, I'm going to 
say thank you, but no, and stay where I'm at. What happened was the airline was getting ready to furlough all their pilots. Apparently Tower Air did this every, two months out of the year before, so they wouldn't have to pay their pilots uh, for two months. And then they would, the Hajj would pick up. And then in January, they'd fly over everyone over to Saudi Arabia and start flying again. And so, but I didn't know this. And their chief pilot at the time was in Florida on his way to New York to meet with the owner and tell him, all the airlines are, are, are hiring right now. Do not furlough anyone this two months. You're not going to have anyone coming back. Okay. And so, but he missed his, he, so they would have pulled that. They re rescinded that. So he missed his flight, got in a car accident, missed his flight, missed his meeting. The furlough notice went out. I stepped on property and saw a furlough notice. I'm, I'm on this list. I said, yeah. And I said, I have a job opportunity at Northwest and the, the, the managing pilot up there at the base, he says, go take it, you know, I'll give you a recommendation. He says, they're going to furlough. And so because of that car accident, I, I accepted the job at Northwest. And then shortly thereafter, Tower Air went out of business. So it was kind of a little twist of fate. Otherwise I'd still been there. So I went to Northwest, became a training instructor on the 747, wrote training manuals. Um, I had instructed at America West and instructed down in Guyana. And so I had, uh, much experience writing training programs. That was kind of my uh, uh, focus. Um, wrote Q, our quick reference manual, wrote training scenarios, wrote a study guides, was a Czech airman. And then Northwest merged with Delta. And we have two different cultures. And so these cultures merged. And I looked at Delta and I thought, what the heck are you guys doing down here? Because this was like the primo of the airlines. You know, everyone at, back in the day wanted to be a Delta pilot. Uh, but I do have a friend who was at Northwest who received a letter from Delta that said, we don't hire women. We're sorry, <laughs> you know, back in the day. So they were, oh, they were really <laughs> anti-women. And, and out of all the airlines, when we merged, prior to the merger, I think they only had about 2% women when the rest of the industry had 6 to 7%. Okay. So, but the culture, the safety culture, what was going on, uh, uh, not giving the required oral and putting in false grades. Like they passed it, but they didn't give it. And one of the things that I knew was this level of understanding is probably the biggest aspect today with aviation safety because our pilots lack understanding. And so I'm thinking, how can you ever assess if you're giving a written, you know, first they're giving the, the questions to memorize to pass the test, and then they're not giving the oral. And it was just this very odd culture. And that's what prompted me to go back to school and start re learning more. So I, I went back to get my PhD in aviation safety and I learned about SMS. Well, we had one, but nobody knows what it is because they're not training to it. So I wrote um, an eight year ethnographic study of examples with safety culture, just culture reporting culture, this whole scenario. And it took me many months to meet with senior executives at Delta, uh, to VP of operations and uh, uh, senior VP of operations. And I was warned, don't do it. They're going to get you. No, I'm going to give you a section 15. I didn't know what section 15 was because in today's world, I was perhaps naive thinking that, you know, why would a company get you if you're trying to help them? And so I gave this 40, finally it took me three months, gave him a 45 page report um, I was very dismissive at the meeting until I called out this and this and this and this, and then the eyes kind of opened wide. Well, it was within a month, they had me meet with an HR safety investigator because they were taking this serious. Well, they weren't taking it serious. She was not an HR safety investigator. She was the manager of the employee past travel complaint department slash EO. And she had been with the company for over 20 years, had never interviewed a pilot. Uh, I asked her where we were going to meet at the airport. No, we're going to meet at a hotel. Um, I said, well, we can meet over at my house. It's just my husband and I home. Oh, no, no, no. I've got a room booked. I got to the hotel. We were in a lobby. She had my re safety report in the lobby and we're discussing near catastrophic issues. Uh, Delta Airlines coming within seven seconds of impacting the ground in Atlanta. Uh, A330 uh, going around because they don't know how to operate the aircraft and the power keeps coming up on them and they just don't know what to do. They don't know. They just bring the power back a land. Um, 
uh, very critical things in this lobby. And then a week later, I was pulled from duty, but they didn't ever told me why. Uh, sent me to a psychiatrist in Chicago, uh, Dr. Altman. He subsequently, it took me three years of writing letters to Illinois Medical uh, Board to get him removed, but he, they were going to uh, prosecute him. And what they ended up doing is he forfeited his medical license to avoid prosecution. So I filed what we call a, a whistleblower law. So if I can tell, ask all of your audience, if you would go to my blog, carlinepettit.com, there is a link to change this law because I have proven, Delta has proven that this law is not going to help any whistleblowers. It's not improving aviation safety with the intent because Delta drug me through six years of litigation through which should never have happened. We, it was a nine day trial. They lost. The judge gave me an unprecedented award of 500,000. Typically it's only 50,000. And he awarded me, um, uh, well, attorney fees are different. So you only get about, you get reasonable attorney fees. So you're only going to get about 90% typically. So then they appeal. And then we go to the appeal process and the appellate court said, Delta, you're wrong. But then they questioned the judge, why did you give her so much? Because it's compensatory damages, not punitive. So they were going to have us go back to court, which probably would have cost me another $400,000. And I might have only got, now I'm at the point where 90% of my attorney fees might not even cover the award. Okay. So, so this is kind of getting crazy. And so then we started deposing the executives again. And finally they just said, we're going to back out. And so what they ended up doing is offering me what the judge paid me, the initial award and all my attorney fees. So it made sense to do that. And that was last November. And the unfortunate thing is with this law, nobody's held accountable. And the person who is in the senior VP uh, Steve Dixon became our FA administrator until the news came out that this was going on. And, and it was actually Captain Sullenberger, the, the captain who landed in the Potomac, who, who stood up and said, this is wrong. That man who violated this law, who did this to you, should not be FA representative. But part of the problem with the law is you don't hold anyone accountable. So he made it in as FA administrator. He worked for Delta. Delta actually paid his legal fees, had an attorney up there supporting him, which should not, never have happened. So he's out in DC. And then uh, I believe the government, whoever this board, they told him that Delta lost and they gave him the opportunity to retire because retirement was within two days of my ruling. So he, he, re, he retired to be with family, but I know that FA couldn't take the hit of this loss again. So at the end of all this, the CEO who's involved, uh, if any of your viewers would like to go watch the YouTube video titled Ed Bastion, I don't know what a cannibal executive is. We, we videotaped his deposition, James Graham, there's six videos on that deposition, but the problem is with this law and why I'm trying to change it is because nobody's held accountable. The senior VP who did this and, and grant that they lost in court, they lost their appeal. They lost all the way around the senior VP who did this broke this law became our uh, FA administrator, the VP who involved, he was really the James, James Graham was really the instigator of the whole thing. He was promoted to senior VP. And then after trial, he's now sitting as a CEO at Endeavor Airlines. The woman who pretended to be the uh, safety investigator, uh, within two to three weeks, she was promoted to a management position in Salt Lake City. Um, and Bastion's still there. The attorney's still there. Um, the doctor forfeited his license, but the people at the airline who paid this, nothing ever happened to them. Okay. So with all this going on, um, it was, it was very weird, uh, psychologically because my health started, I win, they gave up, they paid me and then my health started failing. And, and I really think it had to do with, um, the mind body connection, because in my mind, 
I always thought I persevered at actually it was six years of litigation, but it was over a seven year period of time. And I persevered because I, I always thought it, there'll be change. We'll create change. We'll make a difference. It'll be worth something. Somebody's life is going to be saved because of this. And at the end of the day, even after I won, nothing changed. And then I, and then I felt a little guilty that I should have taken him to the mat and not accepted that settlement. But I don't know if I, at that point, if it, it didn't make sense to go back to court if, to, to not even cover my attorney fees. And so, so it, it didn't logically make sense to even do that. And so I did the right thing, but I, I felt like, like I let him get away with it. And so in January, I decided that I do not want to work with the culture of this group and I can make more change if I leave. So as of, as of January uh, 31st, I retired four and a half years early just to get out of it. And what I've been doing is I've been using my a blog as a platform to try, try, uh, try and create change and, um, and hopefully it'll work because there's a lot of people who've through the course of what I've gone through, hundreds of people have reached out over the years asking, you know, needing help, needing advice. And uh, quite a few of them have been able to actually help their own issues. But there's a lot of a lot of change and a lot of safety that needs to be fixed. And I don't see it happening unless we can get that law changed because laws are created. It, it needs to have punitive damages to make it significant. And you need to hold people accountable. And it uh, and it's astounding to me how the CEO can still be a CEO and the chairman of the board. But then again, an old FAA administrator, Michael Huerta, left the FAA and walked onto Delta's board. And he's the person who enacted the Federal Regulation Safety Management Systems. And that's what they were found guilty of violating. So, and he's still sitting there. So, yeah. So my story of of what gave me the strength and brought me to be able to stand up to this airline. This is, I am not the first person this has happened to at Delta. I'm not the first person this happened to at other airlines. I'm just the first person who has stood up, succeeded and survived and said enough's enough, no more. Okay. So I am the first person who I would say beat them at their own game. The only problem is those players are still out there and they shouldn't be. Do you think there's a possibility of progressing it? Well, it is because even after retirement, I am still, and, and one of the very reasons I'm very busy right now is because of this, because there's a lot of issues going on and that people are reaching out and I'm, and I'm trying to help them through it. I have a few more years of fight in me to try and get this fixed um because it's it's a matter of safety it's your safety every time you walk on an airplane and that's the part that they don't understand and even even you know passengers don't think it can happen to me but there are so many close calls at delta airlines that nobody's heard in the news it's like the united was came within 800 feet of the ocean and it's all over the news but Delta had an aircraft that was 2,000 feet per minute, heading straight to the ground, and the pilots didn't know what they were doing. They finally pulled it out, and they missed the ground within six, seven seconds at 2,000 feet per minute. But nobody hears about this. They've had multiple aircraft line up over the taxiway. So something needs to be done. And because I have heard from, I've got pilots at, at Delta Airlines who call me and tell me we are going to have an accident. Okay. I, somebody at United Airlines said the same. I mean, it's, it's industry. Something is going to happen and it needs to change. And, and really the, the themes of all my books, the writing actually has been my therapy. I, I have to tell you, if anyone ever goes through any, any, uh, attack, personal, uh, persecution, um, you know, it, anything traumatic that you go through because post-traumatic stress is a very real thing. But what I was doing is I started out writing a novel 
And then the novel merged into the truth of what was going on. You know, the flight for control was just an industry related issue. And then with the German wings thought concept into it. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff's going on and I'm writing. So I'm just taking real life and creating fiction out of this. So all these novels, when I do the nonfiction version, I'm going to have a fun little contest. Okay, everybody, you tell me which part do you think is real and which part is fiction. It's scary that this stuff's going on. But to, uh, to go through it, I went back to when they were putting me through the psychological uh uh, doctor, this doctor actually made me bipolar. They paid him $74,000 and he made me bipolar. I went to the Mayo Clinic. Um, comparison, their doctor for 74 made me bipolar. It was like $3,500 to the Mayo Clinic for three days, uh, multiple doctors, panel of 10. But one of the doctors said to me, he looked at me, he says, how, what are you doing in your life? How are you uh, able to sit here with such composure having gone through what you've gone through. Okay. Now I want to tell you that was before, before and going to court. Okay. The court's way worse than what they did. Okay. So, but he says, how are you able to do this? And what are you doing? And I said, well, I just had my eighth grandchild. And I said, and I'm writing books. And then he said, oh, are you in those books? And I thought about it. I said, yeah. And I said, actually, I'm a couple, like three different characters in this book, these books. And I said, uh, one of the scenes was my pilot character had to come back to the Mayo Clinic and was going to be the determining mo moment of her career. And in my book, my character is single and this is her life. Aviation's her life. So, unlike me having kids and I have a whole nother full life. But the, the counselor in me is counseling the other person in me. And so I had my two characters. I'm telling this doctor this. I said, I've got these two characters sitting there. And the counselor friend, and they're having a glass of wine, the counselor friend tells, tells Darby, she says, you know what? They might very well get away with this. And if they do, your life's not going to be over. It's just going to be different. And so I'm writing, and I didn't plan on writing that. I'm just having these two characters, this character talk. So sometimes when I get into writing, my characters just start talking to each other. And, you know, like our heads, we, we talk to ourselves, we think this, and we think that, and we're, we're doing these inner dialogue. Well, I'm having my characters do this, okay? And all of a sudden I thought, isn't that a profound statement? No matter what goes on in our life, we could lose a marriage, we could lose a child, we could lose our job we could lose our health, we could lose a limb, whatever happens to us, our life's not over. It's just going to be different. You need to, have to learn how to deal with that and look at it. Okay, now this is the new life I live. How do I live this new life? You know, And that's really what helped me get through this, this whole thing. Um, but can we change? Uh, do I have it in me? Yeah. Uh, doctor down at the Mayo Clinic that I had just gone down to, uh, integrative medicine doctor, he said to me, which was very thought provoking. He says, you know, he says, you've made great strides here. He says, but I don't think it's going to be changed in your lifetime. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, you're right. He goes, you probably won't see the ultimate change. He says, but you've pushed it. And as far as you push it, it will continue on. So somebody will pick it up and keep moving with it. It has to, um, it, it's gotta be. And, and part of me, and this is the thriller novel, uh, people go, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. You watch, you're young enough to watch this. What I think is going on is the FA is looking the other way for training. They're allowing airlines step standard training because the airplanes are automated. We have what they call the ASAP system, aviation safety reports. Uh, Delta's VP five years ago was bragging in court that we have 75,000 a year. Okay. How can that possibly be? Um, I want to take that back. It might be 25,000. I'll have to go look at them. Oh, it's a lot. Um, so, so I think they're cutting back training. They're allowing these incidents to occur and they're improving automation. And what's going to happen is the airlines are going to say, look, pilot shortage. Look at pilots make errors anyway. We have this great technology. We don't need them. 
and they're going to start getting pilots out of the cockpit and ultimately with the goal to let the automation do it. And it'll be first, we've required four pilots. It'll be cut down to three, three to two, two to one. And that's where they're headed with this. And, you know, you could say, oh, it's a conspiracy. Well, aircraft manufacturers are already working with them. Uh, FAA is looking the other way. It, it's, you sit back and you look at the big picture, you can kind of see the writing on the wall. And um, yeah. I may not be here to see it, but that's what what's happening because they should be they should be fixing it. They should see it. They already know my research proved that the level of understanding causes airline crashes. I, I actually the surprise in my in my research was the more pilots went to training, their performance decreased. At the airline level, I had seventy four hundred pilots participate and uh, think about that. The more training you get your performance goes the other way. So there's got to be a problem there, but they know it. They know it and no, and, and no legislative body is doing anything to fix it. So. This is scary. Yeah, it is. Very scary. <laughs> you mentioned some books of your publications. If someone wanted to tap into your thinking process, which books should they start reading first? Which one would you recommend? Yeah, the first book that I wrote was called Flight to Success, Be the Captain of Your Life. And it was really just a motivation book that it's nonfiction, has different stories. So uh, not just designed for pilots. If you're a pilot and it kind of there's a lot of insight on it'll help you through training concepts, but just motivation on how to handle your life with aviation and the and like each letter in flight to success is f is for fear uh list l is listening and learning identity uh gratitude you know so each of these letters is a subject and it's all positive and it could be for pilots or not pilots just uh, uh life concepts really good uh normalization of deviance is what i took my research uh I think my uh, dissertation was 386 pages. Nobody's going to read that, but I turned it into a book. And so you can see what's going on in aviation and, and what we learned in this research. But the most fun about that is that I've received comments, quotes from pilots around the world. And I, and uh, I promise to keep them anonymous, but their quotes are in the book. And it's an eye opener and fascinating what what's happening around our world. And then the novels uh, started out flight for control was my first uh, just on the industry, what's happening. And, and what happened after I wrote that book is German wings crashed and everyone said, well, how did you know? And I didn't know. And then the second one um, after uh, flight for control, I think it was flight for safety. That was the merger of two airlines and I was on the A330. And so I wrote these training issues and then Air France crashes. Okay. And people are like, how did you know? You know, so it was almost like my book started out writing the book, the incident, writing the book, the incident. And then when I got into school, uh, my flight for survival was kind of a little introduction to safety management systems, same characters go all the way through, um, so each of the novels is a little bit different. And then we get to flight for sanity. You can imagine where we're there. And then the flight for truth is my characters coming back and flight for discovery. The most recent novel is really fun because uh, for anyone who's interested in legal issues and thriller, it's the actual real depositions ended up in that book. I mean, I changed the characters names and merged some of the characters, but so the whole novel series is and it's a central theme it's my theme from from many years ago where this industry is headed and it's just proven its course basically we're going to be going to automation we're going to try and get rid of pilots and and we should not get rid of pilots we should just train our pilots and, and allow them to have that level of understanding that they need to have when their aircraft breaks. That's the important thing. So, but yeah, so, and then I've got a children's book. It's called the ABCs of me. Uh, I am awesome. The ABCs of me. And it's a picture book with 
you know, different careers. Like I can be an astronaut because I'm awesome. I can be a builder because I'm brilliant. You know, little little poems and and one of my daughters and granddaughter illustrated that for me. So, yeah. So we got a little bit of something for everybody. <laughs> Is that the airline industries moving towards? The automation process of eliminating potentially pilots uh we are actually now in a very good time not necessarily a very good time but in a time where artificial intelligence is kicking in and a lot of people fearing for their jobs do you think this is where it's heading that all the pilots will be eliminated we're going to have self-flying planes like we have self-driving cars Well, it's going to be, they already have it. I mean, Airbus Industries already done this. They've have, uh, actually I've got, I went and pulled the report out. I want to say two or three years ago to put in my novel. That's going to be my next novel flight for justice. because I found it fascinating, but they did numbers of takeoffs and landings in a cat and a, passenger category Airbus. The military has been doing it forever. Uh, I know I shouldn't say forever for a very long time. Um, but what was interesting when I was working on my PhD is these drones, these commercial airline 737 drones that are crashing in the military. The reason they were crashing were all the reasons, the same reasons that the old airplanes were crashing because people didn't lack crew resource management skills and they weren't doing transfers. And so I'm thinking it was probably a good thing the airlines and the military didn't get together because it would delay that automation getting here but it's going to happen. It's a frightening thought. And here's the reason why it's a frightening thought. Uh, can automation fly airplanes? Absolutely. Okay. But this is going to be our next level of terrorism. Okay. Imagine this, even if you have right now as a, as a pilot, we, if we keep, we got TSA, we got all these levels of security to keep the bad guys off the airplane. So they don't take the airplane. Okay. So if somebody were to break through and get through every single level of security, they got one airplane, right? But we've, we've eliminated that. We have so many protections, we're keeping them off the airplane, okay? But if they did get on, they got one airplane. Now imagine the warehouse that is staffed by uh, not even college graduates. So you don't have to be a college graduate to, to run a computer to fly an airplane. And you got all these kids in this big, huge warehouse and each one of them is responsible for 10 airplanes and they're all flying out around. What's the level of security if they break into that building? How many airplanes do they have? They'll now have 50, 100,000 bombs in the sky if that facility ever got compromised. And that's the scary thing, at least with the pilots on, we're, you know, we know we're going to do our best to survive. But if I'm on an airplane that's being controlled on a ground base, um, you know, and, and also it's like, if you're, if you're in this facility making 60,000 a year and somebody comes in and offers you, you know, 10 million in a offshore account, what are you going to do? What, what's the young, young person in there is making, you know, basically minimum wage going to do when they're offered that amount of money. Hey, well, here's the keys to the building. Come on in. I'm out of here. I mean, it's, it's a, that's the part that nobody's thinking about. They're trying to make it impenetrable. So uh, somebody can't hack into the airplane, but I haven't heard anyone talking about who's keeping it. So you can't hack into that facility. It'll have to have more security than the white house. And we have proven now the white house isn't even secure that if people want to get in there, they can get in there. So yeah, it's going to be a, a, interesting future for aviation unless somebody comes in and says uh -uh, we need to beef up training our pilots should be trained better they need to have that level of understanding and we're going to keep the pilots in control you know matt think about this what happens if we automate the whole world and every job is automated which they're trying to do who's working <laughs> You know, think Which about unfortunately that. might even happen sooner than we think, based on many interviews or discussions online. A lot of creators of artificial intelligence are fearing that if the governments are not going to implement any 
drastic measurements to review how artificial intelligence is being distributed online and made available for people to teach them the systems. It's a dangerous game we can actually reach rather sooner than later. So we need the entire group, the world, to take steps and measurements and actually understand the dangers of artificial intelligence. And in my opinion, what I've seen online, and that's a scary, scary part at the moment because a lot of things that happen on social media, as you know, influencing already people in a negative way because people are not questioning things, researching things. Like it was back in the days, less internet was still available, but there was a library. You had to actually physically walk, uh, read things up, understand them, question them, and not necessarily accept whatever you have available or in front of your eyes immediately that's out there on the internet. And right. It is a quite scary thing. But do you think, uh, coming back to that, I think it's more down to providing more training or maybe giving people higher salaries to prevent potential threats if they were to decide to automate they, the industry. Yeah, they need to they need to provide pilots more training. And if they give if they give a those type of jobs the salary that would make somebody not want to lose their salary. Yeah, I, I that's really not the answer that we're going to have a security breach of that facility you watch that's going to be the key it, who's ever who's ever running all those aircraft we're going to have a thousand bombs hundreds of thousands of bombs in the sky one day if they go to that it's going to happen um yeah and when will i be here to see it hopefully not but people are going to go back and read my novels and go, oh, my gosh, she was right. It's true. It's kind of like COVID. Uh, who was it? S Stephen Koontz, I think, wrote back in 2014 or something about the this virus that was coming out of Hunan. <laughs> you know, you go back and read it. And he wrote about this, you know, years. That's going to be mine. People aren't going to say, oh, it just happened. They're going to look back and go, yeah, she was right. It's exactly what they were doing. Exactly what they're doing. And... Um, it is going to be scary. So the, the scariest novel I write, it will be that one that says that that one where this actually happens and how they do it. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, this automation thing when, and, and when you say artificial intelligence, I keep thinking of my executives at the airline, it's, uh, artificial intelligence, <laughs> but, um, yeah, they're, it's I, I view it as fake intelligence, but you know I know what you're I know what you're talking about that that our machines are thinking. But we have to tell the, the this future generation that just because they hear it on social media doesn't make it fact, and that's the problem in our society. Anyone can say anything they want, and they say it, and all of a sudden people believe it just because it's been spoken. You know, you really should research and, and look it up. And like, I'm trying to change this law. I'd love everyone just because I said, I want you to sign this, go sign it. But I'd really like you to download it and read it and see why we're going to sign it. I want you to understand, you know, so you're doing it with a, an informed decision <laughs> to, you know what I mean? It's like, we don't have that anymore. Um, yeah. So while we're at the topic, what advice would you give the younger generation? What pilots say, trust but verify. Okay, trust but look verify. And my advice to the younger generation is I think, you know, that right now there's a lot of, oh, we have mental health. It seems like mental health issues are everywhere, right? And some this has been coming up as like, is it more prevalent? Are we just talking about it more? But I think what's going on is that our younger generation doesn't have coping skills. Okay. That even, even when we had COVID and we were locked in, we're locked in. We have our computers, our television, we got entertainment, we got communication. We can order out food and have it delivered. Um, that we don't know how to cope when something bad happens. And you can, I believe you can learn coping skills. You know, it's like they didn't have to, like, I have it so much easier than my generation. I don't have to go out and plant and harvest and to get my food, you know, I just go to the grocery store and buy it. 
Um, so we, I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing is learn how to cope with things. Don't, don't blame people. Oh, it's not my fault. I had a bad childhood. It's my mom's fault. No, it's not. That was then. This is now you get to, you get to make your choice on what you're going to do from here forward. Um, you know, have some values, get some, have some ethics just because some politician on the media gets away with lying and doesn't have to go to jail. Doesn't mean you have to be like that, you know, pick and choose, choose wisely, and then have a little compassion for people. Um, compassion goes a long way. And then I want to say forgiveness too, because we should all, you know, they say forgiveness is like, uh, if you don't forgive somebody, it's like taking you taking the poison to kill them right it hurts you more than it hurts them and i might one of my novels i'm a right next is called flight for revenge because it just goes with the series and my friend goes carlene you should really write flight for forgiveness and i thought about it, i go yeah that's gonna be a really short book <laughs> you know and i and i say that jokingly because i actually don't feel any negative emotion or animosity like i want to go get these people who did this to me i kind of feel very sad for society that our society is allowing people like that to do something that they're not you know what makes people strive to do something like that doctor take seventy four thousand dollars to give somebody a false medical to destroy their life and get rid, rid of their career who would do that? You know, that's one thing that money and uh, money and power is not everything. You know, read Flight to Success if you want to know what success is. At the very end, I tell you what success is. But it's not money. It's not power. You can't take your money and power with you when you die. Um, you know, there's it's so much more. But I think too many people strive for that. And and all the people who I have known who do bad things to other people, it's for money and power. So, you know, what's it really worth that you're dying, you know, in your deathbed, you can go, wow, I got two hundred million dollars in the bank and I hurt a lot of people in my life. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself, you know. There's more to it. Like, that's not what this world's about, you know? Yeah, that's a very powerful message. Yeah. We need more advocates to, to promote that message. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What career advice would you give to someone starting in a profession? In my Flight to Success book, I do talk about this as well, because quite often we get into professions because your career counselor told you you should, or your parents say, oh, you should do this. You're, you'd be a doctor, and then they want to push you off to medical school. Really, you should find find something that you have a passion for, because passion is going to carry you far, and it's going to give you that desire to put in that extra effort, whatever it is. If you just are doing, you know, it's like you want to do something in your life that you love, and you go, wow, they're paying me to do this. So, so despite the manner in which I got into flying, I, you can't do it. My very first flight, I took off at 16 years old in this little airplane. The instructors, you know, said, you got it. And then I rotated and I thought, wow, and they're going to pay me to do this. You know, it's like, this is really cool and super fun. So find something that you love, you know, and, and then go with that. And if you do have choose a career in aviation if you do somebody out there goes oh i want to be a pilot that's all i ever wanted to do um even though now some of the airlines are not requiring a college education anymore because they can't get pilots find pilots to come work for them with the college education i still recommend getting one and getting your degree in something that you love something else that you love you know like uh if i would go back to school i got mine in business uh management but I would go back, if I would go back to school, I'd do it in art. I do it in writing. You know, there's so many things that I love. So it's kind of like your backup career because with the airline, it is, um, you know, your medical could go like that. And then your career shot, you know, just with, with the surprise. And so it's nice to just kind of have your little backup plan. And most pilots have a backup plan anyway. So, but I say, choose a career you have a passion for. And you'll enjoy it so much more because it won't be like you're going to work. It's like you're you're doing what you love. 
Okay. You said before, it's not important to have the manager aspect in life being the richest one, 200 million and hurting a lot of people and ending up being a bad person down the line when you die or <laughs> move to the other world. Let's put it in that way. So what would you say in your own words would be a key to successful and fulfilling life? What's important? It's going to be different for everyone because a lot of people, and, and here, here's what I'm going to say this. A successful, fulfilling life is having a family and loving children and this. But when you say that, somebody who's not able to have children then are going to believe I can't have a successful, you know, fulfilling life. Okay. So, so describing that life is difficult, but if you have a life that you wake up and you're happy to go forward each day, you, you wake up and you're, you're excited to start your day and you look forward to it and there's people or places or things that you want to do. Even if you wake up and say, Today, I just want to sit in the middle of my lawn and meditate all day. Okay. It's being able to, to do what you want. But, but with that said, I still think that sense of responsibility is huge. Sense of accomplishment is huge. Um, you know, having a doing right by others, you know, cause we have a half, some of our society is thinking, I'm not going to work and I don't have to do anything and you got to take care of me. And, and there's a quite a bit of growing a group like that, um, which is another topic for another day, because we should take care of our people. We should care about humanity. But then again, should humanity not be part of society and working if they can, you know, so, but a successful life is uh, living by your values, living strong, uh, enjoying what you're doing. And, and not harming other people, you know, that's allowing and accepting. If you can allow and accept people to be who they are, I think and and enjoy your day, I think you're pretty successful. Okay. Probably finally, what's a piece of advice you've received that stuck with you throughout your life and why? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, actually, you know what? Uh, one thing that my mom said when I was young, uh, which kind of is aligned with what we're talking about. She said, it doesn't matter how much you're being paid. If you've accepted to do a job for whatever it is, you give it your all. Okay. And that's really stuck with me to, to do it. I have often saw witness people do it given half the effort but they don't pay me enough. And I'm thinking, oh, that's what mom meant. It doesn't matter. You've accepted to do a job, you give it your all. Whether they offered you 50 cents or whether they offered you $100, you should have the exact same amount of effort digging that ditch because you agreed to do it. You know, and, and so we don't have the right to justify it. So I think, I think giving it your all. So I think that was good advice. <laughs> Any final words of wisdom parting our ways today? Would you like to share anything to the younger generation at all? Um, yeah, other than what we've already talked about, don't listen to everything. Don't believe, you know, trust, but verify. Um, and just don't, don't live on social media. Your life is not about your phone and your computer and everything. Try and get out and actually live it. And, um, and, I think in the media, you know, when we start, I, I believe a lot of young people are watching these reality TV shows and, and they're living their lives, watching somebody else live their lives. Uh, go out and live your life. Go out and take a walk. Go out and exercise or meditate or, or smell a flower today. Do something just to get out and, and clear your head and get away, tune off, which is probably not good because you want people to tune into your show. And I'm telling them to tune out of your show. So here's what you do. After you've watched <laughs> Matt's show, then you turn it off and then you go, okay, I'm going to walk away and go do something fun today. Uh, <laughs> my This mind, body, soul thing, there's quite a bit of a truth to that. 
Thank you so much, Colleen. Really, I appreciate your time answering all my questions and sharing your stories. Very interesting stories, by the way. I'm sure that all the viewers are going to enjoy what you've shared with me today. And yeah, I wanted to thank you again. Hope we get to speak again in the future. I'm curious and I'm definitely going to start reading your books. Yeah, thank you again. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And keep up the good work.